Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're starting our top 60 best games of all time. Now, I've been playing modern style board games since 2012, mid to late 2012. I've been tracking my plays of board games since 2014. And so with the tracking of my plays, I can tell you that I have played 310 games 2,305 times, and uh, that's about 2,077 hours of play time, and with an H index of 24, meaning that I've played 24 games at least 24 times. Now today we're bringing you number 60 through 51, but before we get into the list, I do want to mention our sponsor, StoneValleyGames.com. This is your friendly, distant game store run by Eric and Wendy. They have got a great thing going on over there. Some of the games on this list will actually be at their store, so check that out in the description below. There'll be links to all that. They actually have a ton of great games over there. They've got war games, board games. Well, war games are board games, but they have both of them. They also have card games. They've got RPGs, uh, living card games, collectible card games, everything you need to fulfill your tabletop needs, they've got it. Go check them out. They also have some cool programs. If you live in the continent of the United States and you order $100 or more from them, they'll ship to you for free. If you live or if you are in the United States military and you are stationed overseas with an AA, AE, or AP address, they'll ship to you for free. And if you are a return customer, they do have a loyalty program. So go check them out, stonevalleygames.com. There's a link in the description below. Also, if you want to support the channel, there are various ways you can do that. Check the description for some possible ways. Of course, subscribing and liking the video is a great way to support the channel, Pro probably the best way to support the channel. And then there's also the super thanks comments. Go down to the comments, leave a super thanks. That is always very welcome as well. So first up, we have Mandala Stones. Number 60 is Mandala Stones. Last year, this was 79, so it has definitely come up in my estimation. Uh, let's see what we've got here. We've got, uh, these are the player boards here, and what you're going to be doing is you'll have your own player board, mainly for keeping score, but also you have this down here as well, which is going to be important. And you're going to have this main board in the middle of the table where you'll be putting... To start the game, you'll be stacking all these up, and, and they'll be stacked in random stacks, you know, uh, like this on these different areas, uh, just like that. And and the all these areas will have these stacks on it. And you can see there's two different possible patterns on here, and but let's just get let's get a few stacks going here. So. That's just how some stacks would be set up, and again, you'll have them all over this board. And you got these two different uh, pillars here. Uh, you actually have two of each of the patterns. But let's say that this, you know, this pillar was over here. Now I can move it from here to somewhere else. Now uh, let's say I move it to here, for instance. Well, that pattern means I'll take this, this, and this, but not this one because it's a different pattern. Uh, I could move it here, and then I would only take this one. Now, on top of that, you know, obviously, like I said, you'll have these other ones out there. You're going to have four total uh, out here, and, you know, they could be in all different places on the board. And so if I move this one in here, well, having these next to these guys, they, it guards it. So it really, like, you're not able to take those. So it really uh, adds some strategic possibilities for not only what you're trying to take, but what you're trying to prevent other people from taking. But let's just ignore these for a minute. And let's just say that I took these three. Then I bring it over here and I'm going to stack it up on my board. And you have these five different stacks that you're able to create. And maybe I've got something like this going on my board. And then I can decide on my turn, well, rather than taking more, rather than moving one of these columns here, I will actually take, uh, I'll score my area. Well, you can only score things that have the same color on top. So I'll only be able to score these two if I score pink. And so what I would do is this one right here means that you, I'm gonna, it's going to give me one point for, and here's your point marker, one point for every different uh different height stack that I have. I've got zero, I've got two, and then both of these 
have three, so they're so I've got zero, two, and three. So it's gonna be three points right there for that stack. I'm gonna take let's see three points, and then this one is too high, and so you can see right here it gives me two points. So I take that one, and now I got five points for that scoring. And then the next time, if I decide to score again, well, now I've got, uh, it'd be these two that I'd probably want to do. And I've got four points for this one because there's only one there. So that jumps me all the way up there. And this one, again, is three high. And so I get four points for that one, too. One, two, three, four. And that was a really nice scoring, uh, scoring round for me right there. And so you just keep doing this. But then when you're taking these off of the board... They're going over here, and this is the timer for the game. So if you're playing with two players, well, so when I take them off the board, I put them down like that, and, you know, maybe later on somebody scores three, uh, three like that, and every time you cross one of those, that's an additional point that you get, so additional two points, and you keep working your way around, and then eventually when you get here, that's the end of a two-player game, three-player game, four-player game, and that's how you play Mandala Stone. It's a ton of fun. You have these... Uh, scoring cards, a, a secret um, secret scoring uh, cards as well for in-game scoring. It's one that my kids have really started to uh, enjoy and seeing their minds work and see them actually start to strategize what they're going to take off of the main board and in which stack they're going to put it here and then when they're going to score moves up over here. That whole process is just really cool with a lot of cool uh, choices and possibilities. Number 59 is Azul. It's up 10 spots from last year. Last year it was 69. And this is another game with some cool acrylic pieces. Uh, the, the player boards are certainly more colorful, though you do have this less colorful side you can play on. But this is the default side. This is the side I usually like playing with. And uh, it's one where you will be drawing these tiles from the center of the table that they get drawn drawn and placed out and you end up uh, putting them down in, in this area here and then eventually they come over and as you uh, build out this pattern you're going to start gaining points and all that's tracked up here uh, but one of the key things and is that as you're selecting which ones you're going to pull from the center of the table you are able, you know, if you end up leaving stuff out there where a person is forced to take tiles they can't use because once a tile covers its spot then it cannot, it can't go anywhere, like, like you cannot bring another, uh, for instance, up here, I couldn't bring this this back here because we've already got that spot covered, right? So if you start making it so people are having to choose tiles that they can't use, they go down here in the waste, and these are negative points that they have to account for. And as the the rounds go by, and people, you know, you, you people are going to have less and less space over here, and so they're going to have more possibility of getting these negative points. And you can really start hate drafting against people, but while simultaneously drafting stuff that is going to be helpful for you. And I mean, you just have all these, you know, beautiful looking tiles, and there's so much fun to handle and play with. The kids love it. Do uh, you also have in-game scoring here that's tracked right here? Uh, you know, this is this is one where uh, very similar to Mandala Stone in the sense that the decisions all seem fairly straightforward to the point where it's easy to pick up but then as you're playing you really start seeing some of the strategies about not only what tiles you want to take for yourself but what what stacks to leave out on the board uh f to mess with your opponents and all of that it really starts to become a very interesting uh decision set as you play azul but this is my number 50 59 azul Number 58 is Genotype. This was 41 last year, so we've fallen a little bit. Haven't really gotten into the table much this past year either, so that could have a little bit to do with it. Uh, this is a game where it genuinely is educational while also being fun. And, you know, you've got, and that's the rule book, but hold on, let me find, there's actually this book in here as well that explains why they thematically chose the different mechanisms for the game and so it shows you know how the mechanisms are actually related to the real science i thought that was pretty cool but this is a game where you are essentially researching uh, these peas to figure out genetics and 
you know, uh, so for instance, we'll just take uh, these the blue ones here from the top. Uh, you know, when you when you roll these dice, and, and you're you're rolling, you do a lot of dice rolling in this game. But when you're rolling the dice, so here with the initial setup here, uh, a three is right there. Um, heteros, hetero, whatever, that one. Uh, the X goes right there. The four is there. And the one is there, and the one is there. All right, so that's how that works initially, right? But throughout the game, maybe you end up changing it to like this, which would mean that now the, the one stays where it is, the three would actually come over to this column here, and the four would move to that column there. But you, of course, could then uh, change the top one maybe like that. Oh, and you can't even see what I'm looking at here. There you go. So the top one could be changed to both lowercase r's or both uppercase r's as well. If you do that, of course, then everything's over here. But if we did it with the lowercase r's there, well, now what we've got is uh, everything, everything is going to be here in the middle column. And so you're able to really work on adjusting these to try to get more of what you're looking for for your particular setup. And you have you know these for all the different uh, options here uh, where you know you're researching seed shape, flower color, pod color, plant height down here on the bottom. And as you're doing this, you know you've got these different uh, different plants that you're going to be using to gain points at the end of the game as you as you go through the research. Uh, where are there are tools that you can use to, you know, seed bags, rakes, graph knives. Basically, they give you different abilities to help you along with what you're trying to do. You also have people in here that help you out. Uh, different people from, I'm, you know, I'm assuming probably people who were actually, maybe actually around during the time this was going on. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but you've got your player board here as well and so you actually place your plants on here as that you're researching and you can get additional slots and everything as as you you know purchase uh you know new plot dice slots action markers higher assistance all that stuff uh, and as you go through you just keep you know building up your research until eventually of course you know you end up uh, scoring points at the end of the game and whoever has the most points wins but it's a cool little, not little at all actually, it's a fairly uh, detailed worker placement game. You have these that you put down on your spots as you use them. And yeah, it's a ton of fun. Now, I have not got into the table. It's been a while. Maybe I did in this past year. I'm not 100% sure if I got in over the past year, but it's one that I definitely want to get back to the table. And I feel like once my kids, the, the two little ones are the ones that I primarily uh, game with as far as the people in my family. Once they get a little bit older, I will be able to finally introduce this one to them, but they're just not quite there yet. But there's what I love so much about this game is how all of the thematic, uh, all, all the mechanisms tie into the theme and the theme ties into the actual science behind it. It's a lot of fun. That is Genotype. Now, number 57 was 50 last year. This is Viticulture. I think seven spaces uh, accounts for like new games coming and everything. This is basically in the same spot it was last year. Viticulture, this is the Essential Edition, which I do think is the one you should get if you get it. Uh, the other option would be to get the uh, the the revised edition i don't know it's a lot of confusion as far as this goes you definitely want some of the expansion stuff and i feel like from, from the tuscany expansion i feel like the essential edition brings in most of what you want from that so in viticulture players will bid on not, not really bid but you know you have player order and you get to choose where you go on the track here and you know if, if you select lower down you're going to get a better reward but you're going to go farther back in turn order uh you got spring summer fall winter and year end here that all happens and you've got the summer areas that you can place your workers and so for instance if, if i've got you know three workers right now i've got to decide okay how many am i replacing in the summer area because you can only do summer first and you know maybe i place 
one here or you know one here and and one one here but then i only have one left for the winter area so when we enter winter i will then only have the one guy left to do something with and so that's something you got to keep in mind now across the top of the board here you can see you've got these different cards so you've got summer visitors which is what the yellow cards are the green cards are where you're getting your wine from the purple cards are your actual wine orders and the blue cards are winter visitors and the visitors give you special little abilities that uh, sometimes one time use, use, you know, immediate use, whatever, uh, different things that can happen. And as you complete the orders, then you'll actually create residual income, which you will collect at the, uh, the end of the year. So then you have more money coming in. Uh, one of the expansions that comes with this that I really like a lot is the mom. It's called the Mamas and the Papas, and it basically gives you some starting resources. So, for instance, if I have Papa Allen and Mama Alyssa, then I will get these starting resources just to give me kind of a boost to get going uh, straight from the beginning. The game goes. The game goes until somebody hits 20 victory points down here on the bottom of the track. Of course, you can go a little bit farther uh, because everybody gets the same number of turns, I believe, is how that ends. But besides this board, you, of course, have your player board as well. And so you actually can create some areas here on your player board that workers could go. Uh, let's see. For instance... Yeah, if you created the yoke, you put a worker there. Uh, but this is where you're going to plant your your uh, grapes and everything. And then as you start harvesting grapes, they'll start going into your uh, grape vats here. At the end of the year, they'll age. As Then eventually you can turn them into wine and then uh, they'll age. But if you only have a small cellar, you can only get so you know, such a, a particular quality of wine. But as you upgrade a medium and large sellers, then eventually you get all the way out here, which will let you complete better and better uh, uh, wine orders. And you can get uh, down to blush and sparkling wine as well. And when you build the buildings, they have these, you know, cool little buildings that go out here on your board also. So that kind of gives you a general idea how this works. The having the areas that you're able to use only at specific moments during the round is really cool I like that a lot when you're playing with more than two players i don't yeah when you're playing with three or more players you have these bonus areas you can go into and uh you know there's several different strategies that you can you can try as far as uh how to win but you can see one thing about having the summer and the winter is that you've got the the planting happening over here and then the harvesting happening over here and then making the wine and stuff just a lot of really cool things going on here this is one that one time i made the mistake of trying to introduce it to four new people who also were not gamers and we got through about one round because there were just so many there's so many choices to make for a uh, a new uh, somebody who's new to the hobby but if you are pretty well versed in the hobby then this is absolutely in my mind one of the kind of classic worker placements at this point modern classic and you really should get your hands on it it has a lot of great choices in it uh, i think you know it plays what's the player count up to six players and you know, that, that probably run a little bit on the long side for a game like this, but I feel like it still really, really sings. I've played it once or twice solo, and that's enjoyable, and it is really popular in the solo community. Not, you know, my type of solo game is more of a narrative-based, narrative-heavy type solo game, you know, Aeon Trespass, Kingdom Death, stuff like that. But this was still a lot of fun, so if you're into solo stuff, check this out as well. This really could be a good one for you. So my number 56 was 61 last year, and that's Century. Now, this is Golem Edition. Um, Spice Road, though, is the other, the original version. And uh, either one, they're identical, just with different themes, but literally the exact same game. But so Century Golem Edition is... Uh, just a little game where you are essentially building an engine and 
you've got these two different types of cards out. And so you've got these cards here, which are the golems that you're trying to collect. And you've got these cards here that give you the ability to essentially convert these gems right here into different gems. And the gems are worth different amounts with the, uh, the pink ones here being worth the most and then the blue ones and then the green ones and then the yellow ones and that's that's the order of value there and so for instance you know if i had if i owned this card if it's in front of me you know right now it's kind of set up like it's out in the offer still but if it's in front of me i could take two of my gold gems here turn them back in and take a blue one out because the blue ones again are more valuable and if i'm trying to collect a bunch of blue ones you know then i would want to get you know five of them so that i could then collect that golem to get the 15 points and you can see how you can upgrade and be more efficient so you know on a turn i could actually trade in four of them and get two back instead of having to do two at a time uh you know trade the the uh, blue into pink you've got all these some of them just give you uh, what you want this one trade a blue into two green and a yellow so lots of different combinations here so that you can really get a good engine up and running and, you know you've got a certain amount that you're able to hold on to at any given time and uh, as you're playing you really are just going through these decks finding all these different cards that you want lots of different golems to go after and really cool artwork and, and it's just this engine building back and forth and so you know this is one where you you initially start building your engine and then at a certain point you have so many cards that you're like oh you know what i uh maybe i have bought too many and it's actually my engine isn't I, i've put too much into it and i really can't use half of what's here and so you kind of start focusing on specific cards and, and or maybe a, a new goal comes out that makes you think hey this is a different direction i should take uh and the art really draws in really draws people in i found i have really enjoyed it so far i think that the uh, again the little ones you know so much of gaming as a parent is finding those games that you can enjoy and the kids do do too unfortunately my two little ones are 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 right there in my same mindset with games it's just what can they handle uh, up to this point and this is one that uh, we've played a couple times together and they've enjoyed particularly my seven-year-old it's just a beautiful game with beautiful components and some really cool choices it plays in like 30 minutes at the most so that's century golem edition so next up is number 55, which was number 18 last year. We're talking about Beyond the Sun. I'm not really sure why we had such a big drop on this one. This is the biggest drop out of this section of the list. Uh, but Beyond the Sun is still a really fun game. I don't actually own it, so we're over here on Board Game Geek. I'm going to show you some pictures of it here. And a lot of people describe it as... Um, uh, tech tree the board game which is pretty accurate i mean you basically are uh, you know, you've got this board here this actually looks like uh yeah it's got okay there's this is the outer space board over here this is the tech tree board and you know you start with just the initial tech and then as you play along you know you and the other players are both researching and so you can feed off of the other players research uh, meanwhile, you're also going out here and exploring space. And and really, though, this tech tree is the main portion of the board. I'd really say this over here is sort of a, a, a side... Uh side game almost but it, it certainly is something that you can use to to win the game but I, I feel like you can win without using that as well and there's all kinds of different techs there's like four different families of technology the red green yellow and blue i believe and you know so each of these will increase your ability to do certain things maybe increase your ability to go into that outer space area but maybe you know you're you're doing other stuff instead. And you can see you've got your people here, different, so that there's a, uh, a definite uh, worker placement aspect to this. But uh, you've got people as well as ships that you're dealing with. And it really has uh, just such a great feel as you progress through that tech tree. And if you can progress farther, you know, and 
and, and you're getting farther, deeper into that tech tree in such a way that you can actually use stuff that maybe other people aren't able to use yet, that is a, a great feeling as well. And, you know, like I said, th this is the outer space board here. And some people will focus heavily on that and really try to generate or, you know, use that to its maximum extent in order to try to uh, generate the win. But then other people will almost entirely focus on the tech tree side of things and ignore, completely ignore the outer space, uh, the, the spacefaring side of things. A lot of cool, uh, you know, parallel universe generator. So a, a lot of, a lot of cool decisions here, a lot of interesting decisions here and and then the the theme of building that tech tree just really uh brings it home and, and it's something that you know everybody enjoys tech trees in games and and if if that's you you know if you're one of these people that does enjoy the tech trees in games then this certainly is a game that i think will capture your imagination because it focuses so heavily on that anyway that is beyond the sun by number 55. Now, number 54 is Ghost Stories. This was number 60 last year, so still kind of holding strong in that same general area. This is one of the most difficult games you'll ever play. Uh, the, there's a newer version of this called Last Bastion that is a little bit, a little bit more, uh, a little bit easier. They're very different theme, uh, but the idea here is you'll have these tiles out. These are all different locations, and you'll be playing as uh, let's see, you have these different monks. So there's the, the red, blue, green, and yellow. They each have kind of their own powers. And the board gets set up kind of like this. So you have your, your monks that are out here on the different areas here. And each area has its own ability as well. So the monks have abilities, the areas have abilities. And you are fighting off these ghosts as they come in. Let's see, I think these are the... Yeah, I'm pretty sure these are the boss ghosts here. You can see just some super creepy, uh, super creepy artwork here. But all these ghosts are coming in, and so you have the different colors, and as well as black. And so as they come in, they'll end up getting placed down in you know the different uh, different areas here, and they can end up all over the board. Some of them are going to actually be kind of invaders, and so you'll have this showing that they're getting closer and then eventually they'll take over uh, a section. And if a section gets taken over, essentially it's deactivated, it gets flipped over like this. Uh, when you're fighting them, you're rolling these dice and you roll the three dice and you can see like, for instance, this guy, you gotta get three reds to beat him. And so you roll them, I only got one red and there's re-rolls and stuff like that and, and different things you can do. You have these different tokens here to give you extra hits and uh, extra abilities and stuff like that, but all kinds of bad stuff can happen in this game. This is one of the invader guys. There's like these dice that get rolled. Um, there are different stuff that's that's really, really challenging. So as you, as you play this, the first time you play it, this game feels impossible. And it feels, it can feel random too. And the more you play it, it's one of those things where you just start figuring out how to mitigate these dice rolls. You know, and you can't have up to four dice at one point, depending on different stuff going on. But you find out how to mitigate the dice rolls. You figure out where is the best time to place these guys out. Because what these guys do is essentially, if you were to end up placing a monster uh, on that or a ghost on that uh, spot, then the ghost immediately is defeated. And, and so there's all these different decisions you make to start mitigating when's the best time to use the special ability of your monk because it's not something you can do repeatedly. You're going to have to recharge it once you use it. And, you know, uh, depending on the ability, of course, uh, there's some abilities. Or actually, I think all the monk abilities might be that way. But regardless, the, finding the right moment to do it. Find, you know, when if, if an area has been taken over, is it worth spending the time and resources to bring that area back or do we just let it go and we're going to focus on taking out the ghost? Because you've got to make your way all the, all the way through the deck and then defeat whatever boss ends up being in there uh, at the bottom of the deck. I, I, I've had... I have not played this with my current game group. I did play it with... My one of my older game groups, they played one time and they tapped out. They didn't want anything to do with it again. But it 
to me is still a blast. I like the last Bastion version. I have played that once, but to me, Ghost Stories is still the uh, the better version. It's the original version. I like it a ton. It's so challenging and so much fun. That's Ghost Stories. Number 53 is Avatar The Last Airbender Fire Nation Rising. Now, this is, of course, built off of the, I think Thanos Rising was the original game in this, uh, with this system. But what this is, is you've got, uh, you've got the Fire Lord Ozai here standing in the middle of the board. And based off of cards that you're going to draw... Uh, these cards right here, uh, you know, you draw this one, Ozai turns this way, and it will attack everything on this side of the board. Uh, and, and that's kind of kind of how it goes, you know, again, turn this way. But then it's also got this Ruin thing down here, and that's for the Ruin track, where you'll have this going at the same time, and you'll have the Fire Nation token on this side, and then your Team Avatar token over here. And every time the Fire Nation draws a Ruin 1, this moves up. And the reason, and then meanwhile, over here, you've got things you're trying to do to move yours up. And it's a race to the top, essentially. Whoever gets the top first will have an advantage in the end battle which will be you have to fight or you have to uh, complete these battles at these different locations here. Uh, and technically, technically, they come out here randomly, but I always like kind of putting them where they would have happened or closer to where they would have happened in the actual uh, something like that. Anyway, that's regardless. Uh, so they come out and you got to complete those, but whoever gets to the top of those tracks will have an advantage because... You have this deck, this deck that you're drawing through, and these cards are coming out to these different locations like this. Well, hold on, let's get rid of Team Avatar here. Okay, so the cards are coming out like this, to these different locations. Some of them are going to be bad guys. And it looks like my kids have gone through and sort in. Uh, organize these anyway uh, something like you know like this right that's that's maybe what you've got out here well if the fire nation makes it the top of that ruin track first then all of the good guys who have this symbol on them will not be able to be used during the end stage of the game alternatively if the team avatar gets to the top first then all of the bad guys that have that symbol won't be able to be used so that's why you're rushing up that track. Uh, meanwhile, you're going through, you're rolling these dice, trying to either recruit good guys with the dice or defeat bad guys with the dice. And as you recruit good guys, you add them to your specific team. And you are playing as either Zuko, Katara, Sokka, Toph, or Aang. And each of them have their own abilities, have specific dice pools they start with. But again, as you recruit your team, you'll be able to add more uh, dice to your dice pool. Every time Ozai turns, he's going to attack all the good guys in that location. And you actually are taking your entire team to different locations to do different things. And what it really comes down to is rolling these dice... And then using your team to mitigate the results, to get re-rolls, to, uh, you know, for instance, if you're trying to, maybe I've got Ang here. So I've got one of each color, and I'm trying to, uh, let's get rid of these real quick, trying to recruit uh, Hakoda over here, you know, so I'm that I'm over here to roll these dice. Uh, well, there, okay, so you can see Hakoda needs one of the air symbol, so I got that, and one of the earth symbol, so I got that, but I actually need two earth symbols, so now I roll these again. Uh, oh no, didn't get anything, but maybe uh, this could go to that guy instead, and roll one more time, and okay, so nothing happened. So fortunately though, as you play, you will increase your dice pool, like I said. This game is really straightforward in how to play. It's Easy to jump into, easy to uh, to to learn, and it's it's really light. You know, there's there's some decisions. I do feel like there's 
plenty of ways to mitigate the dice rolling. So I don't feel like the dice rolling is any, is not a game that is purely luck driven by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you also have these tokens here that you gain through various means that will give you additional abilities and additional ways to mitigate everything. Really, really fun. And if you like Avatar, if you if you like that series, Avatar or even uh, Legend of Korra, if you like either one of those, I think there's there's tons of stuff in here. I mean, there's so many characters from the show, right down to like these minor characters, uh, Due and Tho. You know, we got Bato, who, all these guys, King Boomy that you recognize from the show. So much fan service in here. And then all, I mean, we've got the, all the way down. We got Ju, Judy in here. We've got Hama. I mean, Hama, when she comes out, by the way, that is a rough card to deal with. That's Avatar Fire Nation Rising, my number 53. Now, number 52 is the seventh continent, which is my highest riser in this section of the video series. Uh, it was 79 last year, and it's up to 27 this year now, or up 27 notches, I should say. Uh, now, I, I will say, I think part of why it felt so far last year, because it's traditionally always been in this list, uh, it... Right before making my list last year, I had a uh, very poor playthrough of it where I got very frustrated. And I think that might have colored my perception. I think where it's where it's at now is much more accurate to where I believe it should be. So, so this one obviously doesn't have a board. Uh, let me find the, the right... I don't want to show you all any spoilers, so I'm going to try to start with the uh, what's known as uh, intro island or whatever the, uh, the the first island you always see when you're playing the initial would they would they recommend be the initial quest yeah here we go uh zero one zero okay yeah so you got all these cards in here right these are all uh most of them are map tiles there's also food tiles there's there's uh places where you can uh hunt places where you can fish traps all kinds of stuff the, these tiles over here are exploration tiles for events that will occur when you explore and you know you've got your your little uh people here that you can that you will be, and there are, they each have their own abilities as well. And so when you, you start here at uh, zero, 010, zero, if you play Voracious Goddess, which is the first curse that you play, the curses are scenarios, and you're going to have all these different tests on here. And when you're playing, uh, let's see, so for, and in this case, we've got uh, a spot here to explore and a spot here to explore initially and you know if i want to explore this one i'll flip this over and then it gives me some sort of test to do that i and, and i have to get a certain number of successes that's what the stars are and it says that i can uh draw zero plus cards so uh, zero is the minimum that way if i could generate a success without drawing any cards that would be good and the reason why is the cards themselves this deck of cards is not only where you're going to be getting different abilities and different uh you know uh, equipment and stuff but it's also your life force so as you draw through it you are going to have to be careful how quickly you're drawing through it because that is going to when you run out of it you flip it over or or you you technically start drawing from the discard pile but if you ever end up drawing a curse card from the discard pile, the game is over. So you have to be real careful with how you're going through this. Now, you'll see as you draw, these are where the successes come in. And so here we got one and a half successes. Um, so then we would have two successes. Let me see if I can find the other half of that star. So here you go. So if we drew three cards and it was something like that, then now we've got three successes. And so three successes is a pretty expensive uh, a pretty ex expensive test and so you won't see that until later in the game most likely but you know maybe i come over here and i explore this so this says i'm going to have to draw one card but i don't need any successes i just have to draw a card and so that would let me pull card zero 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 five 
which right here you get a little blurb on the back and then this goes here and you're basically looking up this cliff face and you have you could you know I, I could try to climb it uh for drawing at least one card getting two successes and you might successfully climb it or if you don't then this bad thing happens here and so you're going to push through and so after i complete this right here for instance then i can pull out zero zero uh nine right here and you can see that the ter the terrain starts to connect you know and if i complete this one up here then i would get zero 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 or zero zero seven and there you go so the cool thing with this game is that the terrain is always the same like, like it, it, it the area is not randomized if you are playing in the future and you find a spot that you recognize well everything around it is going to be the same as it was before so you are actually learning the terrain of the seventh continent love this game uh i really need to get it back to the table after that one bad experience because every experience before that was was very positive i can't remember now why that experience was so bad but there's so much to explore in here and i don't have any of the expansions this is all just base game stuff here uh so much to explore in there you can uh, uh, you know, you're going to learn advanced skills. That's, you know, what that's there. That's what all these cards are here, advanced skills. You have the skills that are specific to your character. You have, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of exploring this, this continent and, and working your way through the curse, trying to figure out how to resolve the curse. And it's one of those games where you don't really know exactly what you're supposed to do until you just figure it out, which I always liked those kind of computer games back in the day, King's Quest and stuff like that, that were, it was, uh, you know, just an adventure game that didn't hold your hand. And that is very much what this channels. I have not got a chance to try the Seventh Citadel, which I believe, uh, or I should say, I didn't, I didn't back it. I believe it's beginning to fulfill soon. But uh, that one looks like maybe they took everything from this and made it better. But again, I don't know much about that. This one, though, is a lot of fun. I'm glad it's back on my list this year. That is the Seventh Continent. And number 51 this year was number 36 last year. It's Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Now, I will say I'm going to go down to some pictures here. I obviously, I don't own this one anymore. I have, uh, I believe I burned it after I was done with it. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but it's the style of legacy game where you cannot play anymore after you have completed it. So I'm going to go down into the pictures here. So just be advised there may be some spoilers down in the pictures. Just something to keep in mind. So uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, so you, this takes the pandemic system and puts a strong legacy theme over it. You can see right here, here's somebody who has gone through almost everything at this point. You can see torn up stuff. You can see, you know, because literally when your characters, uh, your characters can die in the game. And when they do, you rip up their character card and they are never used again. You have, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have city cards that for whatever reason get removed from the game and you will rip them up and never use them again uh here's a closer look at the board here and uh yeah you can see you've got you know these stickers that you put next to the cities as outbreaks happen meaning that the cities are becoming more and more unstable as a result of the outbreaks and the more unstable they are the harder they are for you to conduct business in and and successfully treat the different diseases that are rampaging through it this was such a breath of fresh air when I got it. Uh, Pandemic is one of the original games my wife and I played together. And playing this together was so much fun. I played it, played all the way through it with her, and then I bought it again and played it through with a game group of mine. Uh, and it really, because uh, not only do is the board changing, permanently changing every time you play, but on top of that, there is a very cool story built into it that has twists and turns and like genuine, genuinely shocking moments. So much fun. Uh, if you enjoy Pandemic and you even like the idea of a legacy game, possibly, like it, it, the idea of a legacy game intrigues you where permanent changes are being made to the board, I cannot recommend season one enough. I, not so much about season two. Uh, we enjoyed season two to a point, and then we backed ourselves into a corner with some of our decisions to where the game's not, it's just not enjoyable for us at this point. But season one was phenomenal. And like I said, I played through the entire campaign twice. So clearly a phenomenal experience. That's Pandemic Legacy 
season one. And that is number 60 through 51 of our top 60 best games of all time. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to come back and check out the rest of the list that we'll be publishing periodically throughout the month of May. Last year it bled into June. Maybe I'll get it all done in May. Not sure. We'll see. But this is a real fun time of the year. I love making this list. And uh, quite a few new ones that are popping up in the list this year. So stay tuned to see what all of that is. As always, if you want to support the channel, subscribe. Uh, give this video a thumbs up or leave a super thanks in the comments below. All of that is very much appreciated. And come back and check out our other upcoming videos. How to play Aeon Trespass Odyssey. How to play Frosthaven how to play Lands of Gauzer, and how to play 1815 Scum of the Earth are all coming up very soon. And until next time, if you're bored online, board offline. <laughs> <laughs>